I don't know how it works. I just know that there's so much more of God that we don't experience because we've been taught one way or the other. And so just for, for listeners, I would just say, go after God with everything and see what he has for you. Last week, we started a conversation with Robbie White where he spoke in powerful detail about encounters he personally had in the spiritual realm that will raise the hair on your arms. If you haven't listened to it yet, consider going back to episode 71. There are some segments in this episode that refer to the first part of our conversation in episode 71. But today, we rejoin our conversation with Robbie as he tells of his experience with a prayer language a prophetic gift, healing, communities, and an audible commission from God. This is A Stronger Faith. I'm Stacy McCanns. And once again, Robbie White. Sharing stories with me. They're real. And this stuff is happening. And this, you know, there again, you know, I've, I've got several friends that I know now in the missionary field where that's just normal. I've it's, heard that. Overseas, it's normal. It's, it's normal to see, you know, like, and that's one of the things Chris, you know, Chris was telling me. He's like, Robbie, he's like, I've seen a limb come out of a guy with a deformed hand. He had a deformed hand. They prayed over him. He's got two hands. And he's like, it happened. That stuff is happening. And I think we just, we just overlook a lot of it. And in, in my spiritual walk, there was a point where, I would have told you like a prayer language or something like that would have been crazy. And like I said, when I was young, I ran from anything close to that. But I have a prayer language now. And like the more like I get exposed to to that, like you have articles that come out where missionaries that are in the, you know, Southern Baptist Convention are told that they can't have a prayer language. And they're like, well, we're not going into the, missionary field because like if you see what we saw you would you would need a prayer language a prayer language okay so are you talking about tongues like uh yeah a non-english non-english prayer that you don't really understand what you're praying did did you develop this or did this appear with you so this is a when i say this is all happening within a short period of time it was all kind of within a short period of time. Um, the church that I was talking about that was growing so fast, I had went up to the altar on the Sunday morning, knelt down, was just praying over, I think praying over my marriage, just the typical Sunday morning going before the altar praying. Well, we had had elders in the church that would come and pray with you while you're praying. And a gentleman come and put his hand on my back and was praying just like, I'm talking to you now. And then all of a sudden, he was not praying in English. And when he started praying over me like that, my chest starts just pounding. And when he finishes praying, I turn around and look, and it's one of the more successful businessmen in Tuscaloosa, and probably in his mid 40s like late 40s early 50s and I'm like 20 you know 24 25 I'm just like dumbfounded I don't know what just happened so after church I go up to him and I'm like I'm like John what did you just do and he's like Robbie he's like man he's like I was praying for you and then he's my spirit kicked in and started praying for you and I was like, okay, wait, hold on. Like, what? what is that? He's like, I don't know. He's like, I have no idea what I was praying over you for. He's like, but my spirit was praying for you. And I was like, well, how, how do I do that? <laughs> I was like, what is, and, you know, he's he gives me some scripture to, to look at and stuff. And and I'm like, okay, so what, what does that even mean? What does that look like? And I was like, I want that. And he was like, it happened for me when I just laid aside every preconceived idea of what God was and just said I want all of you whatever it is he's like I want all of you and he said I made that prayer it happened he's like I I started praying in my spirit and I was like okay I was like well I'm down for that 
you know, let's, let's go. He prayed over me. Nothing happened. I had the college ministry that we were doing on Thursday nights. I had two or three guys that were in our worship team that were from another church that was a, a Assembly of God church. They would get there early and go into one of the classrooms and pray before our Thursday night service. And I had walked past it before and kind of heard them in there praying. And I knew something was, you know, different. I just didn't really go too far into trying to hang out with them during that period of time. But after John had prayed over me on that Sunday morning, that first that Thursday night I was there early. And I was like, hey, guys, y'all mind if I come and pray with y'all? And they're like, no, absolutely not. And I have put like got prost- prostrate on the ground and was just like, God, whatever it is you have for me, like, I want it. Like, give me everything and nothing. And so next Thursday night, same thing. I go early, I pray. And I don't know how, I don't know how, how many weeks this went on, Stacy, but there was one period of time where I felt like something happened. Like I started uttering some stuff that just came out. Something inside inside did, of me. Was just, it a physiological thing? It was just a feeling. Just, no, it was just a like just a, something was kind of coming like up that wasn't me th- saying anything. And so I immediately was like, okay, that was me. I was making that up. Like, this is crazy. Done with this. Like, the, maybe it was good for John. I don't think it's for me. And I did. I quit pursuing it. And the Thursday night that I was talking about with Lance, um, when he came back to church from not being there for like over a year, when all those kids were around him at the end of the service, by the time I got to him, it came out in front of all those kids. 20-something kids in a Southern Baptist church. My prayer language, my spirit, whatever language came out by the time I got to Lance and put my hands on him. I didn't do it. I didn't say anything. I couldn't stop it. And afterwards, some of the kids were like, what was, what did you do? And I was like, I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I was apologizing. I was like, I didn't mean to do that. Doesn't mean to freak anybody out. I don't know what happened. And that's just, uh, just a part of my faith journey that's happened. And, and now there's, you know, like, I don't go around doing that, like out in the public. Um, but sometimes when I'm praying over somebody, I will, I will, it goes from like me just praying normally to like just something happens. And my wife was brought up Southern Baptist and was, you know, completely thought there again that that was for a different period of time because that's what we had always been taught growing up. And she saw me go through this. She knew me. She knows that I'm not crazy. So she was like, well, I want that. And that was about a year period in her life where, Stacy, she would get up at night, you know, one or two in the morning and just go pray. And um, we had a, a room in our house called like her prayer closet. And like she would go into her prayer closet. And she would pray nothing, nothing. And we were at we were at a service at Church of the Highlands on a Wednesday night. This was before they had the new big building. There was a, uh, they called it the annex or something like that. It was for the Wednesday night services. And there was just like powerful worship happening. And she was standing next to me and she kind of put her head down as she was worshiping. And I just knew it was happening. And I put my hand on her and just started praying in my spirit. And afterwards she was like she's like I just prayed in my spirit and I was like I was like I knew you were I was like I knew you were and that's a part of her faith journey now so like I've I've talked to people I've had you know there's so many different 
camps on being filled with the Spirit, being... I don't know how it works. I just know that there's so much more of God that we don't experience because we've been taught one way or the other. And so just for for listeners, I would just say, go after God with everything and see what he has for you. Because like sometimes it'll make the, what is what, what's the scripture where it says it'll make the wise look dumb and the dumb look wise? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's just so much. Um, and, and then as, like I said, that as that was happening, I was talking to other people that, um, you know, had experienced similar things. It's just, there's a lot of God that we put in a box. And I think when John told me that he's like, man, take God out of the box and let God be God. That was, that was a period of my life where my faith journey went from like, being at one level to just like whatever it is you got for me, God, like I'm there. Were you spending a lot of time with him during that time? Sometimes. Yes. Yeah, sometimes no. Uh, and that's me and my wife just had this conversation the other, the other day. She's like, she's like, listen, she's like, you're leading this family. She's like, um, I don't see you in your Bible a whole lot right now. <laughs> and I'm like, man, in this, in this period of my life, like God is speaking to me so much uh, with direction and and, like, I'm constantly in communication with him as far as like, just what do I need to to do today? Like lead me, like what decisions do I need to make? Like, how do we need to structure this? I would say like, even in the business side of it, I had a great mentor, Jordan Rayner, that was like, Robbie, he's like, you can't separate your faith and your business. He's like, they're one and the same. Yeah. And I would say the past three years, we've had such huge growth in the, in the company, but we, we stopped like hiding our faith and was just really open with who we are and why we do what we do, like what our goals are as a business. And you would be amazed, Stacy, at the amount of people that come like apply for jobs, just like, man, I want to work in an environment like that. Yeah. Like I want to be around people like that. Well, it certainly is favored for the most part in our culture. We, we, we kind of have tended to think that our culture frowns upon faith. And then you see a DeMar Hamlin <laughs> go down and all of a sudden everybody's praying. Yeah. There wasn't an atheist in that stadium that night for sure. And, um, yeah. ESPN, they're praying and all these other places and it, it's exposed. And, um, the truth of the matter is, but, but to answer your question, yeah, I mean, there were periods where, yeah, I was spending a lot of time in prayer and the Word. There were times where, you know, I, I wasn't. Um, but yeah, but I, you, is this a gift? Is is this praying in the Spirit a gift that comes from investing, you know, just massive amounts of time in the presence of God, or and, and not that these are mutually exclusive by any means? Yeah. Or is it just an awakening to the fact that we have sanitized the truth of the presence of God and the yeah. and, and the authority given to us by Jesus? It's it's in Scripture, and we've just we, we've installed these scales on our eyes that prevent us from seeing the truth of who God is, and yeah. so we don't live in that. Well, see, Rex, Rex, you know, had been poor, you know, sharing stuff with me from the time that I had started working at the architecture firm, he would tell me stories like when he came to faith, he wasn't in a church, he wasn't exposed to doctrine or anything like that. He just started reading his Bible. He said when he received, you know, Christ and asked him into his life, he immediately immediately had a prayer link. Like he called it being like he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, which I had never heard that terminology at that point. But like Rex would in the office, like I would come in there and he would, he would pray and he would pray in his spirit. And this was prior to like anything happening. And I thought he was crazy. I thought it was just like, he's Pentecostal. He's got different beliefs than me. I didn't think anything of it, but you know, there again, when this stuff started happening to me, he was one of the first people that I reached out to, you know, and it's like, just like with the, the Josh guy, you know, I was like, Hey man, you said you've been here and done that. Can you do it again? And <laughs> you know, help us. So, 
I think it's different for everybody. I've, I've got friends that I know that have been praying for that for a long time and it hasn't happened. I know people that came to faith and it happened. And I, I, I have no idea how God works on Yeah, and I it's think— so, It's so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I wish I had— because uh, we were part of a church where at the end of um, this conference, like, people would come up to, to ask for it. And I had I had a really close friend, three, and he was on, he was on leadership. He actually served in the conference with us for three years. He came up and asked for prayer for that. The last year that we served on that conference, he came up and received it. It was like three years. We talked about your early. Pentecostal experience, and you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sure that skeptics of this are saying, well, he has a you know, Pentecostal background, and so that just bubbled back up. It sounds like when I've talked to you, a couple of times I've talked to you about this, it, you, you really ran with that. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a thing that no, you uh, were pursuing, looking to embrace later in life because you were proud of some of the things you witnessed as a, as a kid. And then, of course, we see videos on YouTube and social media or whatever of folks running through the sanctuary and jumping yeah. in the baptismal and all yeah. these yeah. things. And and so what we what the world, what the culture believes is that it's just made up. We're yeah. just there's just a bunch of acting going on and it's for show and it's not it's not a real, real thing. thing. I mean yeah. you're, you're, it's something people are deciding whether they're going to do or not. And they've created a culture inside of this rural church or whatever yeah. that they go in there and, they're, and they act crazy all the time and um and it's just it's just acting it's just made up yeah but you're saying it's not and and you and you read right yeah. it, mark <laughs> 16 17 i mean i know there's some early uh, manuscripts that that's not in but there's a lot of early manuscripts that it is in yeah it says and, and these signs will accompany those so we never hear of jesus like speaking in tongues. Now, who knows what language he was right. in his prayers in? Right, because he was always going off praying by himself. Yeah, who knows what that looked like? You're not talking about speaking in tongues on in response to a thing uh, in the in the world or whatever, right? And not necessarily what was even happening on Pentecost, which is yeah. Acts two. Um, but I've I've been told that you know, and this is just everybody, I guess, has a doctrinal belief. But like, there's the gift of tongues, which is like right. what happened at the day of Pentecost, where you actually and and Paul talks about that. Yeah, and Rex might be a good <laughs> Rex might be a good guy to have on your podcast as well. He uh, he said, and you know, this is prior to everything that happened with me. I would have told you, you know, this guy is off his rocker. He went to the Holy Land and he was praying in his prayer language at the Wailing Wall. He said a gentleman, a rabbi, came up to him. And was like, who taught you that language? And Rex was like, that's my prayer language. He's like, I, that's just the way I, I communicate with with God. He's like, that's a he like that's a version of a Hebrew language that hasn't been spoken in like two thousand years. That's unreal. And so Rex is telling me those stories, like, because I was always like Rex, I was like, what what is this? Yeah, like, it's, it's just some sort of babbling or. Whatever. I was like, yeah, I was like, what are you babbling? And he's like, he's like, I don't know. He's like, it's my prayer language. He's like, but I tell you this, I went to the Holy Land. He tells me that story, and I'm like, okay, that's crazy. Who knows? So that's the Holy Spirit praying through you. For stuff. Cause audibly. Because, yeah, and, and, you know, in the scripture that, you know, John had shared with me, it's like, the Spirit knows what you don't know. Yeah, it's sure. And, and it's the, in there. And the Spirit is like crying out prayers and requests that you don't know. And so I have no idea um, how it works or... All I know is just it's just one of those things where it's I just ask for everything that God had and and I don't want to be weird and I don't think I'm weird I don't think I've ever like freaked anybody out I'm very not cautious but like I don't you know it's just like praying over you know like somebody that has a, an oppression or a possession or whatever I'm not looking for that around every corner but if there are indications of something deeper or, or I've got I've got a I've got right now that I'm I'm talking with and all of the preliminary stuff we've talked about, I think he has some deeper issues. Yeah. 
I'm just trying to find the right time to just be like, hey, man, can I pray for you? Yep. Without, because you don't want to ever come to somebody and be like, hey, dude, I think you have like some oppression on you. Like maybe it's some demonic stuff. Like that's not yeah. a good way to, <laughs> to open up a conversation. And I'm, I mean that, you know, maybe how Jesus did it back in the day is just like speaking it right out of them. I'm not that bold. But at the same time, like I pray for like an opportunity to be like, hey, let me, can I just pray for you, man, just to see just what's going on? And I've yet to have anybody just say, no, man, I'm I'm good. I mean, you could pretty much just walk up to anybody on the street and say, hey, man, you mind if I pray for you? And I don't think they're a, most of it. Most of yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you decide to use your prayer language or is it something that just happens? Most of the time it just happens. Like if I'm praying by myself, I usually start my day off in the morning praying over the day and everything that I have going on. Sometimes, it, you know, it kicks in. Sometimes I'm praying with friends uh, or praying over someone, and it it'll, it it kicks in. Um, but I'm not I'm not super audible loud. Like I don't like if I was praying with you and I prayed in my spirit, it would be very quiet. Like I'm not, you know, what I'm saying like it's not a yeah. I'm not trying to get attention with it. Um, the The night that it happened at the church, I, I couldn't control that. I don't know how loud I was, uh, but I don't think I was crazy. All the kids came back the next Thursday night. <laughs> a lot of those, a lot of those kids, you know, that was in that service were very much. They knew me growing up. They know who I was, and they were like, same thing. I asked John, like, how? What? What was that? Like, how did? What was? Because. I've never had anybody that that prayed in their spirit around me where it made me feel uncomfortable. Like it was always a peaceful, calming feel. Like when John prayed over me, I never felt scared. I felt like, wow, like that, like my heart was like jumping inside. It wasn't a something that was like repulsive or freaky or scary. And I would say like anybody that I've ever prayed around where I've prayed in my spirit, I don't think it's ever made anybody uncomfortable or at least nobody's ever told me that so is this life for you now i mean do you actively seek out and pray for and seek out opportunities to tackle uh issues whether it be demonic or healing do you do you pray healing i've prayed man i have prayed so much healing and have you seen it happen i'm not and i you know there again couldn't explain, you know, I mean, we've, <laughs> when I say, when I say like all this was happening in my life in like my mid twenties, me and Lance were, we would go in the evenings to the big hospital in, in Tuscaloosa. We would go to the ICU unit where families were waiting, you know, they have like a prayer chapel yeah. in the church. We would go in there and pray with families for, for healing or anything that, I mean, we, we were, cause I had seen so much stuff happening and in my life. I was like, hi, like, and I was, and I, and you know, like you'd asked me about that time in my life, I was really into the new Testament reading every story, everything that happened with the apostles, with the early church. And, um, there, there was a few situations like we had prayed over a friend who was in a coma, um, and just thought for sure that something was going to happen, and the family decided to to take him off life support. I never felt at peace with that, um, and, and Lance was more involved in that than me, and it, it was just a really hard time for us. And then I had another friend whose mother was um, dying with cancer, and Dylan had asked us, he's like, hey, man, he's like, could y'all come pray over my mom? And I was like, yeah, man, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to. And me and Lance went and prayed over his mother. And, and Stacy, like, I, I saw his mother when I was praying over her sitting up and smiling. So when we got finished praying, I shared that with Dylan. I said, hey, man, look, dude, he's like, I was like, man, I saw your mom sitting up and smiling, man. I think she's going to get better. And... I think a couple days later, he calls me and he said, hey, man, he's like, my mom is sitting up talking with me right now. And he's like, was just overwhelmed with joy. 
and she died like a couple of days later. Mm. And I, did, I, I know what I saw when I was praying. I couldn't tell you, you know. Did you see it like I just you had saw a vision? It. I had a vision. Okay. I saw it, yeah. And right. and that's another thing that has happened. In, in, in and my, she actually sat up. Yeah, she sat up like a couple of days later. And I thought that was complete healing. She was going to be well, and then she ended up passing away, which was, a you know, another just hard for me to understand. But that was another thing that during that growth period in my faith, prophecy became something that I was exposed to where God gives people words and encouragement and pictures Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I would say a lot of times I'll be praying like in, like I said, I got to start the morning praying. Sometimes I get visions for friends and I will send them and you would be amazed at the responses that I get back of like, Oh my God, how did you know what was going on? Like they would tell me, like I had one, I had one a little over a month ago with a really close friend, and I was like, I was like, hey man, I don't know what this means, but I saw you like trimming away the fat off of this calf, like, and it was so painful, like you love this calf, calf, is that right, cow? Yeah. Like, like, like baby cow, like baby cow, yeah, yeah, you calf. were trimming, yeah, calf, like you know, it was it was in the butchering, slaughtering phase of the calf or whatever, but he was trimming off the fat of it, but he was close to that calf, and. I was like, I don't know what this means, man. I was like, but I just wanted to share it with you this morning. He comes back and he's like, dude, he's like, this this has a lot to do with stuff that's going on right now. He's like, I'll tell you more later. And then a couple of weeks ago, he told me that he was having to trim away a business partner that was just not the right. They just needed to part ways. Mm. And I was like, I mean, who? How? How does that happen? <laughs> I mean, like, how? How are you just? praying and all of a sudden God gives you a picture to give to somebody and you give it to them. Yeah, how is that happening? I have no idea. I mean, are you asking for that? No. Yeah, <clears throat> what you've said that I've heard you say is that you ask God, was it to give you everything? Just give me every, yeah, everything he has for me. Everything he has for me. Yeah. So I, I, I pray for more. Yeah. That's kind of where I, and, and you know, I, I don't know if more is like, tapping the brakes a little bit <laughs> yeah. because he is God and he's yeah. if he were to give me everything he gave, I would die yeah, right yeah your mind would blow so you couldn't yeah. do, you couldn't do that yeah and I ask him to give me things as he feels that I'm ready or oh, yeah. to get me ready or to do more uh, I've yet to pray that he give me everything yeah and I, th- I think a good prayer Stacy is you know, and, and this is where we're where I'm at is like I want more to be able to give more. Yes, that's like, right. Not more for myself. No, 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 no. But I want to be able to make a massive impact for His glory and to you know, and that's that's exactly right. That's where you know that's where we are as a business. Is like I don't. If you'd have told me four years ago that you know we'd have 25 employees, we were happy where we were at with like five. Something clicked in me where it was just like. The bigger we get, the more impact we can make. Right. So if I had 500 employees, that's 500 employees that I'm pouring into and giving them a work environment where they're seeing that faith is a huge part of what we do. And then that's also like a massive amount of revenue that we're generating where we can have a massive give back opportunity. And I told our leadership the other day, I was like, some of the largest ad agencies in the world are doing over, I think the biggest one is $17 billion. Omicron, yeah, two point two billions in profit. I was like, what if they were giving that two point two billion back to kingdom purposes? Like, what kind of impact could you make with that kind of right? And they have seventeen thousand employees. And so I I just read a book. It's called Not. It's David Green. He's the CEO of Hobby Lobby. It's like business not by the book. Right. I think's the name of it. But he was inspiring to me just in the fact of like he wants to grow Hobby Lobby as big as possible because they are making a huge impact. They're giving back massive amounts of money. They pay their employees better than any other retail place. I think they start them off at $18 an hour Mm -hmm. and they share their faith all the time inside of their corporate structure. Yeah. And I'm like, why not? Like, why not do as much as you can do? Um, If your eyes are on greater purposes for that than yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Then absolutely. 
Uh, what happened to musician Josh? He is a musician now in a church, a local church. Still, like, I haven't, I haven't taught. I mean, that was twenty plus years ago. I, I, yeah, that's good. What even happened that night? I mean, he, he last last yeah. he left this story. His so, his head was down, and <laughs> he he actually, I don't. It wasn't in our college ministry, but he ended up being on uh, a worship team in another church, and uh, I stayed in contact with him probably for a year or so. But to the best of my knowledge, I think he is still actively pursuing Christ, and he he ended up being on a bass player on a worship team. Like so, so these demons were extracted in that room that night, and as they were exiting, they were screaming their names and went through the fluorescent light and, and whatever and else, whatever and ever how they departed. Or maybe maybe hung around. I have <laughs> I don't know I don't know how that works, but I. I do. I do know that when I was talking to uh, some of the staff and asking questions about, you know, hey, what do you guys think about this kind of stuff? Does this stuff still happen? I was trying to be very vague. You know, I was like, do people get still have demons casted out of them? And and they were like, well, you know, that was really the early church, and it was. And I was like, okay. And I was like, well, might want to check room two hundred three. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was like, maybe something happened there that shouldn't have happened there. I don't know, but it was it was it was post um, it was post apostles. That's all I'm going to say. Um, you might want to check in two or three. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> something you might the lights might be might need to get the lights fixed. So if somebody were to say, eh, I don't believe in this Satan devil stuff and this God stuff, it's you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a, some sort of uh, holdover from uh, an unenlightened, uninformed, uneducated, highly superstitious world that can easily be disproven right. these days. I, I, what's your response to that? Uh, man, I've got an 11-year-old son, and uh, he's in that stage now where he's questioning everything, and... Um, I, you know, I tell him, I was like, you have to have your own faith. You can't have mine. You know, it's like my my faith story will be different than your faith story. But I can tell you, I can't deny uh, experiences. And and maybe that's the, the way God has moved in my life was, hey, Robbie, you're so stupid. I'm going to have to do some things that just really prove <laughs> that I'm, you know, that, that I'm real. And maybe that's the course that you know he's he's taken with me to get me to where I'm at. But um, I would say that I, I don't know I don't know of anybody that has pursued Christ that um, he hasn't responded to genuinely pursued, pursued Christ. Him. That's exactly. I think that's it. Uh-huh. You know, if if you know, um, I've. I had a I had a homeless guy that I was helping uh, that was he was like living in his van. I got him like a he was atheist. I got him a, uh, a small little house to live in. I'd have like you know weekly conversations with him. He was like, "Why are you doing this for me?" And I was like, "Man, hey, I just want to love on you. I want to help you." I was like, "This is what Jesus would want me to do." I was like, "I've got a heart for the homeless," and he was you know he was he was actually. In semin- or this is his story. He was in seminary when he f- decided that God wasn't real because his mother died with cancer. He asked God to heal her. His mother died, and at that point, he was done with it. Yeah, became became atheist. And I guess his you know his his life was in in really bad shape. I met I had actually met him at a Lowe's parking lot for the very first time, and he had a, a white van. I brought brought him some food. Just talked with him. Ended up getting his number, and then you know I, I found a I found a house for him to stay in, uh, put him in a house. This went on for probably about a year, and I thought that you know through everything that I was doing that I was going to help him you know find find Jesus. He didn't want Jesus. He didn't he didn't pursue. I mean, when I say like anybody that like is really seeking Jesus. I feel like he will come. Um, Doesn't happen for, you know, like it's, it's a heart thing. I think his heart was so hardened that 
anything that I said or did, he had a, he had a response to. He, he knew the, he knew the Bible, Stacy probably better than me, but he knew it from a combative state. You know what I'm saying? Man, you wonder what God's doing to break that stuff down. Cause you know, from his perspective, it may be feel, he feels like, uh, he'd be betraying his mother's memory and I, I don't know. Oh, no. Yeah. And I mean, we had, we had some great conversations and it was just one of those things where, um, I just never saw, and and who knows, you know, the fruit, I might not see the fruit. Yeah. Maybe somebody else did, and I pray for that guy a lot. Um, You just never know when, especially when you you start working in that arena of people who have lost everything or homeless or there's so many different factors that play into it that we have no idea of. We look at somebody and be like, well, they should get a job or they they could get off the streets if they wanted to, and there's a lot of people that they have a hard time um, doing that because it's not as easy as like a, it's not like a, you know, quick fix formula. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think with just like asking God to give you everything is just like, you know, I think that surrendering is, is such a big part of it. Of, you got to be, you got to, you got to really want that. Yeah. Because I, I don't know, part of me is like, do I really want that? <laughs> yeah. And what comes with that? Am, am I going to be viewed as crazy? And yeah. Well, Stace really got swept up in this Jesus thing, and you yeah. know, and we're not invited to things. And <laughs> or, or is there hesitation there? I, I don't know. Yeah. We're, we're talking about, and we've been talking about some really high, higher level spirituality than what is often seen in the culture. Yeah. What gets that to that level? What gets to that point? If if people are listening to this and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people like, I, I don't know that I want that level of stuff where I'm in the presence of demons being cast out and, and those kinds of things. I guess the first question is why not? Yeah. Because we're just not used to it. We're scared of it. Scared of it. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I personally would say there's no reason to be scared of it. If you are a child of God, if you are uh, a yeah. believer, you have authority. It, we've been told it's yeah. all throughout Scripture. We have authority over that, so there's nothing to be afraid of. Without it, it probably is. But how would you encourage someone who is saying, "I do want a higher level of faith, spirituality, connection with God. I, I do want a prayer language. I do want to pray healing with success. I do want." Uh, everything is it simply asking God for everything I mean for me it was a combination of positioning myself like that but also surrounding myself with people that through the years like I said I had been exposed to people that had told me things that I had passed off and it was during that period of time of like experiencing a lot of that stuff where I was like okay it's not your 10 o'clock worship service message that you're getting that's really a lot of that part of the Bible. That's um, good, yep. And so, like, I would say seek seek some mentorship or some trusted— somebody in your path has experienced something. You know, it's like even going through your list of podcast speakers, I was like, oh, my gosh, I know a lot of these people. I had no idea that they went through something like this. right. That's almost exactly what happened to Lance with Amber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when I was like, when you start about talking it. about it, it's yeah. like, well, my goodness, like this is that just it's not an isolated case that that happened in my life. And so I think there's a people out there, you know, like I said, when I started asking God for more and seeing a lot of that stuff, I, Chris Devitt was one of the people that I, you know, had reached out to. But you know, I'm sure there's somebody in your sphere of influence or network that when you start questioning and asking stuff, you know, that'll step up and be like, Hey, you know, actually yep, this is, is, you know, we were fortunate to find faith, you know, bodies of believers that believed that this stuff still happens. Yeah. It's next level faith. And I, I think, uh, I think one of the things that the modern church is getting right is it's moved toward creating small groups and, yeah. um, and, 
communities, smaller pockets and communities of believers. And as I look through the list of, or think through the list of guests that we've had on here who have had sort of a deeper, richer, more mature, connected faith, they found themselves yoked yeah. with like-minded, like-minded, like maturity, like, uh, fa- it was, it was co faith builders. Yeah. They were surrounding themselves with people that built their faith, not eroded their faith. Yeah. And so they built it in each other. And, yeah. um, and that's, that's part of our faith journey is we've partnered with other believers that have experienced stuff. And then we'll, we'll do, you know, we've hosted small groups where we share our story. Yep. And I think that strengthens, you know, I would say since that happened to, 20 plus years ago we've probably had 50 small groups we've been a part of that we've shared our experiences with we've poured into it's people that know me that know that I'm not crazy Mm -hmm. that when I you know share that I have a prayer language they're like I didn't know that that existed (laughs) um that's just I I would say like if if you're pursuing Christ and you're asking he gives good gifts and he gives what you ask for and if you're asking for the right things yeah it's a it's a spiritual truth you you are what you eat right if you eat junk food all the time you're going to develop cancer heart disease uh, obesity all these other things diabetes that will kill you if you eat healthy food it's just scientifically proven and it's also a spiritual truth and it's the same sort of thing with your faith Uh, I, i guarantee a dude from south carolina uh Oh, he has a what, faith. <laughs> what wasn't yeah. just that way. Yeah. He began, oh, yeah. he, he crossed a line yep. that was easy to cross, that he could have crossed back over. But he stayed in that place, and he began to yoke himself with people that yep. that became their world. Yep. And, and now, <laughs> you tell me he's been in these battles with Gabriel and oh, yeah. Michael or whatever. I, I would want to ask him, how did that turn out? Oh, I know. Do, I, do you what, think you're going to win that one? One of the one of the descriptions, and I don't think he's. I think he said that he saw the the presence of Jesus one time, and it he was two two like like two football fields of light high or something like. I don't know. It was it was one of the most crazy descriptions I've ever heard, and I was like, okay, that's one that's kind of awesome that you <laughs> you caught yeah. a glimpse of that or Prince what of demons here. yeah but then uh they have a bible like ours they believe the last battle they win ah they and, have been deceived and one of the most powerful things that i feel like god like let me experience from his story was he told Josh you guys have more power and authority than y'all even have a clue of <laughs> this guy this guy told them told josh he's like because josh was like how did you portal a demon into this house and his like response was you guys have a, y'all have more authority than you know he's like y'all are just blinded to it <sighs> and i was like the spirit of truth coming out from a, <laughs> from a yeah, he, but, he, yeah, but he, they, he has but, no authority. He, yeah, that but they believe fantastic. they believe yeah they believe the opposite of what we believe, and it's it's one of those <sighs> it's one of those things where you like like you said you share these stories and you hear like when you share a story, we were in, we were in and I know we we're probably running out of time we we were run we were in a small group with this amazing couple the lady had fled. I don't think it was Syria, but it was one of the war tour countries. Like she had fled there. She had moved to the United States. Her husband was a professor at the UA. They had, they had a lot of kids. They were just an awesome family. And they were in one of our small groups where we were share. I was sharing, uh, somehow something had came up about this and I was sharing the story with the group. And, um, she was like, She's like, oh, Robbie, you have no idea. So she tells me the city that they lived in previously, she somehow knew some people that were in the Church of Satan, which I guess this is a, they're around. They would go on prayer walks through neighborhoods. The opposite of what we would be praying for. Mm. 
And she's like, they are very much aware of the spiritual battle going on. And they're participating. And she was like, we're not. Mm, That's a big deal. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, you just don't think about things like that. You know, like there is an enemy and he's at work. And a lot of his followers are working hard and, and believe are actively and praying actively. and walking the streets, knowing that they are in this battle. And we think the battle is going on up there away from us. And yeah, oh, man. That so, I mean, was, you know, big deal. yeah. So I got one more question for you. And I, you spoke about having a prophetic word for people. You get words. Do you get them for yourself? And if so, I know that God is speaking to you in directing you. He's done that with the businesses that you've formed and run. You, he's done that with other people. Where is he guiding you? It's uh, a good question. Uh, right now, we are just in a, a season of just trying to be faithful with what we have, like We've downsized a lot. We sold our house. We're living in an RV, which is kind of crazy. A couple years ago, I would have said that would have never happened. We're, you know, growing as a family closer to each other. I've got two kids that I'm trying to pour into as much as possible at an early age because I feel like they have such a calling on their lives that that God's going to use them. And everything that I waited to my 20s, late 20s, 30s to to get a handle on. I'm trying to work with them to equip them. I've, I really feel like my legacy is going to be through them. And so the things that I struggled with, with money, notoriety, fame, like the stuff that, that is hard to break, I'm trying to get them at an early age to understand what really matters and do as much as I can to to help them get started at an early age because I feel like I'm going to leave them a lot and I want to make sure they make an impact with with that. So that's kind of where, where we're at. We don't know where we're going to end up living, which is crazy. It's just um, the things that I know that I'm supposed to be doing is putting everything that I you know have into the nine uh, stewarding it well. The nine is an agency that yeah, you formed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Creative agency that, that I've had for about 20 years. Um, I had a, um, I don't really get a lot of visions for myself, but I had shared this with you too, is, uh, about eight, maybe eight, 10 years. It's been, it's been a while. Um, a little, I think it's over eight years ago. Audibly, in my shower getting ready for a church on a Sunday morning audibly just heard the words like through the giftings and resources that I'm going to bless you with you're going to alleviate homelessness in the U.S. heard it as clear as day those exact words those exact words never never had a heart for the homeless never had that philosophy of like, well, they can get off the streets if they need to. Like you could, that's a choice. Right. And I mean, it just, it was so powerful. Like I literally fell into the shower, just weeping. Um, my wife comes in, she's like, what's going on? I share with her and she's like, what does that even mean? And I was like, I have no idea. And shared it with our pastor he was like, you know, Robbie, he's like, man, he's like, that's heavy. He's like, you just got to, you know, position yourself to do whatever, you know, God calls you to do. And it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. And in my earthly, you know, fleshly mind, immediately, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to do something to make a lot of money to do this. If we're going to alleviate homelessness in the U S like I got to make a lot of money to do this. Um, the problem was, you know, eight years ago, I, I wasn't good at managing money. I didn't know how to grow a team, lead a team. Uh, we were just struggling to get by. We would go chase every new venture, partner with people that came to us with ideas. 
trying to pursue anything that could grow and generate money. Um, people call that very entrepreneurial. I call it kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it wasn't until about three, a little over three years ago, um, I really f- I had, had someone pursue me to sell the nine and uh i just couldn't get a piece about doing that and i was having a quiet time by the pool at our old house and was just like in in reading the bible and it was like seek wisdom though it cost everything like gain understanding and it was just like the holy spirit was just like you have never seeked how to run the nine like you should and I just was like, you know what? I was like, you're right. <laughs> uh, I don't have, a, I don't have a, I have an architecture degree background. I don't have a business degree background. And I had Jordan Rayner wrote a book called Called to Create. I had led several small groups at our church with that book. I thought it was an amazing book. He sends out a devotion. I read that devotion like weekly when it comes out. And then he sends this thing saying, hey, I'm going to pour into 12 business owners for the next 12, you know, our period of time. And it gave the price. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, that's a lot of money. But after hitting that scripture and just saying, though it cost everything, like gain understanding, I was like, man, I was like, I need this. And he had already filled up all of his spots. I ended up calling him. He gave me his number on LinkedIn, which nobody ever does. He, I ended up calling him. He was like, hey, we got, an, we got an open spot. It's yours if you want it. And I was like, absolutely. And that was probably like a best period of time in my life. Like it changed my f- thought process. Because he was like, you have chased everything. And God's given you what you need. You have the capability of growing the nine into something. You have no idea the impact it can make. And I was like, uh, I was like, I'm in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> I was like. Like, I'm pretty sure we're, we're capped out at our capacity. And he's like, you don't need to be in Tuscaloosa. He's like, you need to be doing what you're doing everywhere. And I was like, well, that's, you know, easier said than done. Um, and three years later, 90% of our work is outside of Alabama. Uh, pandemic happened, which opened up Zoom and teleconferencing. And it allowed us to meet with clients and potential clients all across the country, uh, and then we started hiring the right people, getting people over every different department in the nine, and just the exponential growth has just been, it's been crazy. But yeah, so I know I know where I'm where I'm no I'm where I need to be right now. Um, but I don't know where I'll be twelve months from now. But it's one of those things of just like wherever it is, like. I'll be okay. Um, one thing Chris DeVitt told me too, as a mentor, he was like, um, he said, Robbie, he's like in my 40 something years of following Jesus, I've had a mansion overlooking the, uh, is it Cape Horn in South Florida or South Africa? I think it's Cape Horn, but it's the, the point, you know, the southernmost point of Africa. He said, I've had a mansion overlooking the ocean there in my times of following Jesus. He's like, me and my wife and my three daughters, he's like, we have lived in a shack in my times of following Jesus. And now we're in America, and they had a really nice home over in Hillcrest area, and he's like, and now I'm here. Two years from now, he's like, I might be back in a shack. But God's provided when I had little, he's provided when I've had a surplus. The biggest thing you can do is just always trust that he's going to take care of you. And as long as you're doing what you're called to do, then you'll be all right. So those kind of words echo a lot for me of just, uh, if you'd have told me I would be living in a 500 square foot space (laughs) with two kids, I'd have told you you were crazy. But if you'd have told me that, you know, my family is closer than it's ever been. My kids are maturing and growing at a pace that like I can't even imagine um at that age it's been it's been good Robbie White 
what a cool spiritual conversation. And uh, this is going to be one of those things that I'm going to find you in 12 months. Yeah, yeah. We're well, going to see what else has happened since we'll, then. We'll be in Alaska. Alaska in three months, I think it's going to take us to get there, and then we'll be coming back. Uh, but, yeah, 12 months from now, I don't know. Yeah. It's some good stuff, man. Hey, it's some super spiritual insights and just a highly spiritual conversation. And I hope it's been challenging for folks. I know it has. It's been challenging for me, and um, I hope we got the guts to ask God for everything. I think that's a big deal. I think it's what it boils down to, even if it makes us look a little unorthodox at at best in the the world's eyes. But, man, hey, I really appreciate you joining, and and, uh, good luck. Yeah, thanks, man. Robbie White tells us that he earnestly sought God with everything he had. Jesus told us that if we seek, we will find. See Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Robbie tells us that in his seeking, he came to ask for everything that God has for him. From that point, new, greater spiritual experiences began happening in Robbie's life. Jesus tells us that whatever we ask in his name, he will give us. See John 14, 13 and 14. More and more people that I encounter report very similar experiences. So the question begs, how deeply have you really sought God? Is there room for more? Are you asking God for everything he has for you? Don't you wonder how good it can get even before we get to heaven? I do. And I encourage you, seek more deeply and ask for more, even everything that God has for you. And for heaven's sake, don't be careful what you ask for. You are asking for God, and He is everything. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. For more conversations like this one, to recommend a guest for us, or to support this ministry, please visit astrongerfaith.org. Until next time, we pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.